Ammo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi samyao sanputoshi. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa. By Qian Wan Jie Nan Sao Yu, Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi, Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good evening. Welcome to our Abhatamsaka Sutra lecture tonight. My name is Reverend Hung Shur. I'm here as your designated sacred storyteller tonight. Delighted to be here with you all. Uh, we have been notified by our tech team that the video and audio are both doing good. Streaming and YouTube are streaming properly. And I'm hoping that that is also true uh, going across the Great Chinese Firewall to our friends listening in Mandarin. So, uh, uh, nice reverb sound, says folks. Good, delighted, all right. And uh, what we're about to do is explore the Flower Garland Sutra. It's called the Avatamsaka, and it talks about bodhisattvas. And we're some bodhisattvas ride motorbikes loudly up and down our road here. Uh, just a moment ago, we heard a kookaburra argument on the trees out back. So I truly live in a place with sonic blessings. The, the uh, ambient sound here in the Queensland bush is uh, it's just marvelous. So uh, to get going with our Flower Garland Sutra, talking about the Bodhisattva path, I interrupted myself there. We're talking about the, what Bodhisattvas do, how they think, how they, uh, how they challenge themselves, how they recover from, from uh, global pandemics, how they make their hearts strong, and how they grow. This is a lot about growth because every bit of the Ten Stages chapter, this uh, long chapter in the Flower Garland Sutra, every bit of it has to do with uh, a candidate for Buddhahood on the slow road to Buddhahood, the Bodhisattva path, how he or she grows, how they develop, how they expand, how they make their hearts bigger and uh, more capacious, more able to hold. And, and our section tonight is the peak of that growth and expansion. You don't expand your mind past the level of the Dharma cloud, fa yun di. This is, at this point, our, our candidate for bodhisattva hood has learned it all. He's, he's, she is at that place where this is the mind's ultimate expansion and there's nothing more to learn past this point. And we're talking about omniscience, right? So really nothing more to learn. So it's pretty exciting to be uh, looking down from the peak of the 10th stage of the Bodhisattva's development to, to where we are tonight. Um, let's get started. Let's get going. We'll click on our text. We're going to come back to page 24 when we're, when we're ready. But right now, we're looking at the invocation. We're going to invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to draw near. And here we are. This is what we say when we do that. And we do it in Mandarin with a banjo accompaniment. Are we ready?
ready, let's do it seven times. Namo da fang guang fu huan jing Huan hai hui o pu sa Namo da fang guang fu huan jing Huan hai hui o pu sa Now, this piece of text is, uh, we've already touched it last week. We talked a lot about, actually, more than touched, we went deeply into this uh, global phenomenon of guanding, of consecration, of anointment, abhisheka in Sanskrit, where uh, a ceremony, you hold a ceremony, and the individual who is about to be promoted in position, a prince is going to be a king, uh, an initiate is going to become a prince, um, a candidate, probably the son, if there's nepotism involved, the son or the, the nephew, rarely the daughter, is going to become a wheel-turning monarch, right? They say women can't say that the old traditions. Uh, when someone is about to be elevated and confirmed in their new role, they go through a process whereby uh, the person who is empowered, the authority, takes oil or water and puts it on the crown of the head of the individual. Um, I witnessed this happening when a student became a bishop, when a priest became a bishop. Uh, bishop John Wester, became the auxiliary bishop of San Francisco. Then he went on to become the full bishop of Salt Lake City and Tucson, Arizona, et cetera. Uh, but it happens in Jainism. It happens in Hinduism. It happens in Zoroastrianism. It happens uh, among the Catholics and the ancient Christians, and certainly among the Buddhists. So how interesting that this, uh, this very exotic uh, and um, well, let's see, I need to, to, to qualify that word. I'm gonna show you some pictures and we've, we've worked out our, our glitches that we had last week. I'm gonna show you pictures of how not exotic this coronation process is because why? Queen Elizabeth was crowned. She was coronated. She had her, she was uh, anointed on the crown. Tsar Nicholas II of Russia was coronated. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was coronated. Jesus was coronated. So we have some pictures. We have an Egyptian pharaohs being anointed on the crown. So how amazing that this uh, here in our sutra, which is uh, maybe the oldest thing that you all will encounter today. Uh, it's minimum 2,500 years old. And actually you'd probably call it ageless and you wouldn't be wrong because it comes not from a textual tradition, it comes from a realization tradition. It comes from the Buddha's own mind once he or she wakes up. 
right? Okay, so let's get into it now. This, we actually, um, as I say, we, we touched this piece of the text last week, but we're going to repeat it and then go further, okay? Because I want people to get the whole picture here. So what has happened is, okay, we'll go back to the, we're going back to the bottom of page 22, Sam. Here we go. Dong Ar okay. Uh, nope, nope, nope. For the Ru Zhuan Nun Sheng Wang. We're going to do the whole um, metaphor, the whole analogy here. Okay, ready? For the Ru Zhuan Nun Sheng Wang, so Sheng Tai Zi, Mu Shi Zheng Ho, Shen Xiang Ju Zu, Qi Zhuan Nun Wang, Ling Zi Tai Zi, Zuo Bai Xiang Bao. Miao Jin Zhuzuo, Zhang Da Wang Man, Jian Da Chuang Fan, Ran Xiang San Hua, Zhou Zhu Yin Yue, Qu Si Da Hai Shui, Zhi Jin Ping Nei, Wang Zhi Zi Ping, Guan Tai Zi Ding, Shi Shi Ji Ming Shou Wang Zhi Wei, Duo Zai Guan Ding Cha Li Wang Shu, Ji Neng Ju Zu Xing Shi Shan Dao Yi De Ming Wei Zhuan Lun Sheng Wang. That's our piece of text. Let's see what it says in English. Okay. Disciples of the Buddha, it's just as when a prince is born to a wheel turning monarch, and his mother is the queen, he develops all the requisite physical hallmarks. The wheel-turning monarch sets his son, the prince, on a splendid gold throne on top of the white elephant. They unfurl latticework curtains and lift up big banners and pennants. They light incense, strew flower petals, and play music. Water from the four oceans fills a golden vessel which the king holds to anoint the crown of the prince. This is known as being appointed to the rank of a king. Ever after, the prince is counted as a kshatriya king who has been anointed on the crown. He immediately is able to practice the ten wholesome paths, and he is called a wheel-turning monarch. Okay, we covered that much last week. Now, this is an analogy. Um, what are we, what's the actual story being told in our sacred story here? It's the bodhisattva becoming a, a dharma king, becoming a Buddha. Um, that's what is the other side of the analogy. But that's, uh, the sutra assumes that we don't know about that. So it's going to give us something we do know about, which in reality is equally esoteric, right? Which is the, a, a normal king, uh, and not a local king, not your, your local king, but a wheel-turning monarch, a chakravartin, who is pretty... Uh, special kind of king. He's a deva in this case. He doesn't live on the earth. He lives in the heavens, the closest heaven to humanity called the heaven of the four kings. But the same, the sutra says, we'll tell you about that. And then we're going to give you the second half, which is the bodhisattva in the same way becomes a Buddha and also gets anointed on the crown. All right, let's step through the text. It's good to, to put our feet solidly into the text and where questions arise we'll say a few words to explain it but then we're going to um, look at uh, some images that we have of this of things that are much closer to us which is other kinds of abhisheka of other kinds of anointing on the crown so it says just like when a prince is born to a wheel turning monarch and his mother is the queen he develops the requisite physical hallmarks. Okay. Chakravartin kings, uh, Konza calls them universal rulers. Okay, well, yeah, they're, Chakravartin means a wheel turner. Uh, when these, these kings have, when they're born, or maybe it's after, it's not clear if they get them at birth or they develop 32 special hallmarks. And they are the familiar 32 hallmarks of the Mahapurusha, the Da Zhangfu 
the, uh, the Buddha's 32 hallmarks of the um, superhuman, right? And if you see a standard, correct image of the Buddha, you'll notice right away long earlobes, often. Usually a swastika in the center of the chest. Um, hair that is curly goes to the right, right? Very large eyes, golden colored skin. Um, hands that are longer than normal. They hang down past uh, to mid-thigh, right? Uh, if you ask the Buddha to open his mouth, you'll discover there are 40 teeth, not the sta standard 30, 32 or 36. 32? Is, our dentist is not here today. 30, 36 teeth. The Buddha has extra teeth in his mouth. Um, more bizarre, they say the Buddha's between the fingers and toes, they are slightly webbed. So how strange is this? That, uh, <laughs> that uh, 32 hallmarks of the uh, great hero, the Da Jiang Fu, the Maha Purusha, right? A true uh, Avenger superhuman, superhero, a true superhero. Um, now, these 32 hallmarks come to the Buddha through his cultivation. The 32 hallmarks come to the Chakravartin through his birth line, through his paternity, through his progeny, right? Progeny is the child, paternity. Through, through the uh, family he is born into, the wheel turning, home, the wheel turning monarch gets his 32 hallmarks. They are different from the Buddha um, in that they come from a different place. They don't come from cultivation as, let's see, I've got a page of notes here that I want to show you. From the Vajra Sutra, there is a quote that says, in our Diamond Sutra, there's a conversation between the Buddha and Subhuti. And he says, what do you think, Subhuti? Can you see the Buddha by means of possession of the hallmarks? Subhuti says, no, you can't. Buddha says to Subhuti, if Subhuti, you could recognize the Buddha simply by the 32 hallmarks, then a universal monarch would be a Buddha. A Chakravartin would be a Buddha. So on one hand, these 32 hallmarks are extra, extra special. On the other hand, um, they are not the same as the Buddha, even though externally they are, right? So in the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha says, Subhuti, here's someone, 32 hallmarks on their body, these extraordinary characteristics that if the Buddha walked in the room, you would be agape, you'd be agog at this magnificent specimen, this incredible human being. Uh, and yet the Buddha says, Subhuti, that's not how you recognize the Buddha. Because why, if you could, Chakravartins would be the Buddha. There's a difference, in other words. The Buddha saying, Subhuti, it's not the same. What's different? Well, it's the inner qualities, the wisdom and the compassion, and the possession of things like what? Possession of Dharani, possession of Samadhi, possession of the four limitless attitudes, compassion, kindness, joy, serenity, right? Plus the possession of spiritual powers. The shantong, those are the things that set the Buddha truly apart from the external, which is a chakrabarton. Okay, so far so good. So now it's interesting that the sutra specifies that the sun gets the hallmarks because the one condition is his mother is the queen. So the question arose in my mind, if the king has multiple wives, which was often the case with monarchs, does that mean that second, third, fourth wives, or if we use the Chinese model, the emperor, um, with all his consorts, every one of whom wanted to produce a male heir, wanted to produce a son, and if she did, then, and the proper wife did not, then her son would be chosen to be the next emperor. And of course, 
the jealousy and the, the backbiting and all of the, the fierce competition to get to be the mother of the next emperor uh, created lots of drama in the, the palaces of China, um, the imperial palace. Now, the sutra says, because the mother is the queen, the son develops the requisite physical hallmarks. I wonder if that's limited only, and our commentaries didn't tell us. Maybe somebody can look into B the Buddhist version of Chakravartins to tell us whether it only sons of the first wife, the actual queen, become Chakravartin sons. We won't know the answer to that question, but look what happens next. The father, the king, takes his son, the prince, and puts him on a golden throne on top of a white elephant. Oh my goodness. Now, granted, this is when this happens uh, to the next Buddha, will it happen in India? Will it be in a country where there are elephants? Uh, our North American continent has, to my knowledge, never had elephants. We have had um, uh, a mammoth, woolly mammoths. There are woolly mammoth bones found in Idaho, found in Wyoming, found in, in uh, Montana. So we have had woolly mammoths, but I don't think that's quite as elegant as a white elephant. No offense to the white elephant lobby. Uh, I'm sure they're, to the woolly mammoth lobby, I'm sure they're, at some point, they too will become white elephants. So what happens next? Look at this. Curtains, banners, incense, flowers, music, incredible offerings arise spontaneously as the prince gets ready to become the monarch. The king holds a golden vessel, and the golden vessel has water, in this case, water from the four oceans, uh, which he holds to anoint the crown of the prince's head. Um, in the stories of anointing on the crown, there's a lot of attention paid to what, what you dribble on the head. What is oil? What kind of oil? There, I read about different varieties. Some oil have cassia flowers. Some oil have sandalwood. Some oil has uh, you know, rose uh, scent. So um, some of the different things that are different kinds of liquids that are considered appropriate as the chrism that covers the head. Here specifies it's water from the four oceans, which I like in that it's, uh, it indicates inclusion, right? Si da, si hai jirne, right? within the four seas, the Chinese say, meaning everybody, no exceptions, right? Fills a golden vessel, the king holds it, and he does drip, 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 and the prince becomes the king, okay? After that, he is called Kshatriya king, who is anointed on the crown. Last week, we talked about the caste system. Kshatriyas are the second caste, which is to say the warriors, the rulers, uh, first caste are Brahmins, the priests, born into that caste, and then after that are the merchants, and after that are the untouchables, the, the outcasts, uh, which have been renamed into the children of God. Right? And at that point, the king is able to practice the ten wholesome paths. He is called a wheel-turning monarch, Chakravartin. Zhuan Lun Shangwang in Chinese, a sage, a sage king, a sage ruler, Zhuan Lun Shangwang. Now, okay, at this point, let's take a look. Uh, we have a picture here of a Chakravartin. Um, is this visible? Can people see my, I'm gonna open my chat. Please let me know if this is visible. Yes, hot dog, it's working. Okay, who is this? Some people think this is an image of Ashoka, who was the grandson of a true Chakrabartan. And uh, there are voices, scholars who will tell you that um, King Ashoka here was the only actual Buddhist Chakrabartan in history. There are other opinions. But notice that around in this image, we have uh, some of the seven precious things, seven treasures that come 
to the brand new Chakravartin. They say that it just happens because of his blessings. When you have the blessings to become a Chakravartin, spontaneously, seven precious substances, seven treasures come to you. When you get to see them, there's the horse here, there's the wheel there, there are ministers or generals, there is the consort, the wife, there is treasures, probably in this one here, um, and the elephant, right? So the elephant, the horse, the wheel, the treasures, the ministers, the and, and rulers, the, the wife, the, the queen, and the last one. I'll have to go into my resources. So I got six out of seven. So those are the the qi bao, zhuan lun sheng mang qi bao, and they come to you as you as you uh, take the role, as you get anointed on the crown. So this is, here is, uh, we're looking there at uh, Ashoka, and let's take a look here. I've got some worldly, oh, let's see, we heard about the golden vessel. Of course, the vessel you use to uh, anoint the crown of the head, this is one used from Russia. You can see how special this is. It's got turquoise or maybe emeralds. It's got rubies and pearls and it's a container, it's a vessel. The entire vessel is made of lapis, is made of uh, mother of pearl, tridacna, and here are emeralds around the bottom or lapis lazuli, right? This is clearly uh, a vessel prepared to do some heavy duty anointing of the crown. Now, let's look at some scenes where this was done. Tsar Nicholas, uh, we looked last week. Here he is over here on the left. And the priest, the long white beard here, uh, is doing the anointing. This is Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. And you can see the, the grand hall and all of the courtiers and, and uh, wannabe courtiers and powerful nobles and and uh, hangers-on and betrayers <laughs> of the, oh, the revolutionaries, probably not so many in this picture, but Tsar Nicholas ruled only for a short time after this. Um, so there, I don't know my Russian history enough to identify who's who, but you can see the, the scene as he is being anointed on the crown, consecrated. Here's another one. This is, this is, uh, the Prussian emperor, um, who, I've, sorry, don't know his name. But you can see the wigs here. This is, uh, here's the priest. He's being anointed on the crown. The courtiers are standing around. The Prussian emperor with all of the witnesses who competed hard to get a seat, to get a ticket, to get in. Oh boy. So there we are in Prussia. And here we have, uh, this is Louis Cannes in France as he is also being anointed on the crown. So here is the French court. So this is worldly rulers of nations. These are political appointments, anointing of the crown. Look at the French wigs that everyone, my goodness, the weekends, the 15th. Very splendid, okay? That's about as ornate as we get in humanity, among humans. Um, here is a picture of Jesus, a very interesting representation of Jesus, being anointed. Uh, this is a biblical story and it happened in his lifetime, his short lifetime. Jesus was anointed multiple times. See, there's, a, there's stories here, we won't go into them because we, time is limited, but here, this is uh, a, a contemporary depiction of Jesus the carpenter uh, being anointed on the crown as he is making the case for one of the Marys here. And the, um, we learned last week that this, this 
putting of water on the head is not only for worldly kings and emperors, as we saw, but it can also be um, for hospitality, that in countries in the Middle East, I think Iran, Persia was one, where, and Egypt, where if you, if you want to truly welcome a guest, when they come in, you take special fragrant creams or balms or oil and touch them on the forehead. So that comes down to, to us to this day. Um, here is a photo, an image, not a photo, it's an image of King David. We showed this last week. King David being anointed on the crown um, and being prophesied to his role as king in the promised land. Uh, king David, of course, is memorialized in the Psalms in the Bible. The Psalms are his songs collected by him or about him. Here's an, a lion, a royal lion, uh, symbolizing king's power. So there's one. Um, going even earlier to Egypt, where an emperor is now an Egyptian pharaoh is being anointed by a, a hawk deity and there's his symbol and these are Egyptian hieroglyphics telling the story of if you could read it there are those who can there are chains of onks that symbol going around and you can see the the vessel that is being used to pour on the crown of the head. There's interesting above this, I wonder if that's a pearl, uh, a ruiju, wish fulfilling pearl. Um, but here I believe is a snake deity. And uh, these are, there's t text on the picture, I can't read it, but this is, uh, do we have his name? We don't, don't know which, king this is, but he is clearly being anointed on the crown in Egypt. All right. Uh, and this is the last one. This is blow that up. This is also King David. Samuel, the, the prophet, is anointing the crown of King David with a very interesting image uh, vessel here. So different artists' impressions of what that must be like. All right, so there we are. We've seen some of the uh, historical treatments of this fascinating uh, phenomena called anointing on the crown. And um, I'm gonna come back to talk about the 10 wholesome paths because what our passage tells us is once you become a Chakravartin, once you become a wheel-turning sage king, you have these experiences. One is these seven treasures come to you um, and you are able to do 10 good deeds. You avoid 10 evil deeds by doing that and you get the title of a Chakravartin, a wheel-turning monarch. Okay, we're gonna come right back to that in a minute. I wanna go now to the other side of our analogy, right? The sutra says, just like when somebody becomes a wheel-turning sage king, it's similar to a bodhisattva, okay? Now we're gonna do just the first two lines of this. Ready, here we go. Pusa show zhi yi fu ru shi zhu fo zhi shui guan qi ding gu ming wei shou zhi ju zu ru lai shi zhong li gu duo zai fo shu fo zi shi ming pusa shou da zhi zhi Okay? English, please. It is the same with a bodhisattva who is appointed to this rank. 
When the Buddhas anoint the crown of his head with the water of wisdom, it is called being appointed to the rank. He can make perfect the ten powers of a Tathagata, so he is counted among the Buddhas. Disciples of the Buddha, this is known as the Bodhisattva's appointment to the ranks of great wisdom. Okay. So this fulfills the, the second half of the formula, which is when it's an analogy, you say like this, da 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 da, so too is this. And the idea is that we may not know what the, what the that is. We know that this is, but we don't know the that. So we look at the this and we get an idea of what the that might be. So what the sutra wants us to know is what's it like when a bodhisattva gets appointed to the rank, becomes deputized to the position. What is the position? He is now a 10th stage bodhisattva and in many ways, the same as the Buddha. He's not really a Buddha. He is almost a Buddha, but he has all of the uh, qualities of wisdom and powers and strengths that a Buddha has. He is counted among the Buddhas. He is known as the Bodhisattva's appointment to the ranks of great wisdom. Okay, so look at that. I mean, we started out uh, maybe most of us, let's, let's step back. Many of us come to Buddhism because we feel like our lives need some more spirituality. Maybe we need to slow down. We feel like we're going too fast. And so what do we do? We stroll into a meditation center. We go to a mindfulness center. We attend a lecture on Buddhist meditation. I did. Um, and we learn how to do that. We learn about meditation. Others of us uh, maybe come because our parents were Buddhists or our grandparents. Maybe grandma had a string of beads that she carried. And maybe she had a Buddha image on an altar in her uh, study or in, her, in the spare room in the house. Um, other people had took a course in college of comparative religion or, as happened here in Australia, um, students from, often from the U.S., but not, ex not only from the U.S., would come on a semester abroad to a local university. In this case, it was Bond University. And they uh, took a class in Buddhist philosophy because they had these, uh, these electives to fill, and that's not a course they would take back home, University of Iowa or Notre Dame or University of New Hampshire, because their parents would go, why are you wasting an elective on that? So, well, I'm in Australia, so I'm gonna take a course on Buddhist philosophy. So they did, and they learned uh, the kind of the tops of the waves in the, in the few weeks that were available over the semester. And so, we get started on the path. And bit by bit, bit by bit, we hear maybe about the Heart Sutra, we hear about the Lotus Sutra, we meet the Sixth Patriarch of the Chan School, maybe we uh, start out with the Theravada tradition, maybe we see a monk uh, walking through the supermarket, out in front of the supermarket, and we say hello, and he answers back very graciously, you know and we're, we're, we're interested. And so we go for a meal at a Theravada monastery and we hear chanting, we hear the five precepts. And bit by bit, these seeds get planted for, or maybe we, we meet the, his, you know, his holiness, the Dalai Lama. You can choose to translate that or not as you choose, but uh, we, we maybe meet him on the cover of Time Magazine or something and we're interested, we wanna find out more. So we, we, look, into, uh, we look into Buddhism and we hear the bodhicitta, we hear putishin, we hear the great bodhi resolve. And so that kind of, what's that? I wanna find out more, that sounds, that's neat. Or maybe, you know, guanyin bodhisattva is the door that we walk through. We just see guanyin um, and somehow that gracious white robed 
female figure just warms our heart, right? I know there are many people who have told me that their first encounter with anything Buddhist was a dream of a skinny, white-bearded, ascetic-looking monk uh, who had his eyes cast down, had beads in his hand, was missing a finger, if their dream was that detailed. Many people dream of Master Xu Yun, Master Empty Cloud. Before they know anything else, they have a dream of this very gaunt, ascetic-looking Buddhist monk. And they find out later, oh, that is Master Empty Cloud, right? We have a story of uh, some friends of ours in Oakland from Laos uh, who established the King Pan uh, Spiritual Center, the largest uh, Laotian practice center outside of Phnom Penh. I guess that's Cambodia, yeah, outside of of Laos, anyway. And uh, they had a dream, one of their uh, leaders in the, their, uh, among their women practitioners group, had a dream of Guanyin Bodhisattva and she, she was having some health issues. She couldn't sleep and she was having anxiety. And when she had this dream of Guanyin Bodhisattva, she, everything went peaceful and calm and she felt relief and release uh, for the first time. And so she set out looking for that image. They were in Oakland and they traveled to Sacramento and they traveled to San Jose and they traveled to, to Santa Rosa and they traveled to San Francisco. And they were looking for that image. And they would say, is that it? And she would say, no, that's not it. And then somebody said, oh, you need to go to City of 10,000 Buddhas in Ukiah, California. Where's Ukiah? Oh, keep going north. It's in Mendocino County, 100 miles north. And so one Sunday, they all got in their van and drove up to City of 10,000 Buddhas. And when, when she walked into the Buddha Hall at City of 10,000 Buddhas, there was Guanyin Bodhisattva, the one she was looking for. And uh, actually, I can, I'm going to do that while I tell my story. I'm going to show what she was looking for. I've got a got Guan Yin on my desktop here. You're looking at a, at a rainbow lorikeet. That's not quite Guan Yin. That's, it sings nicely too, but um, anyway, uh, so she saw Guan Yin Bodhisattva at the city of 10,000 Buddhas, and that was the end of the search. She said, this is truly what I'm looking for, and uh, I, uh, we need to find out who this is. And so uh, they investigated, you know, learned more about Avalokiteshvara and Master Shenhua and the city of 10,000 Buddhas, and that became, they became our close Dharma friends. Uh, let's see now. That's not going to work for me today, so we'll, we'll save that for later. Um, in any case, um, something brings us in the door, right? And we start to, we encounter a sutra. Um, we have a feeling of having been here before. For me, is setting foot inside a Gold Mountain Monastery as a graduate student at UC Berkeley and discovering that, that I had been there before somehow. And it was not a thought. It was hearing the wooden fish, smelling the incense, feeling the chill of the icebox, Gold Mountain's name, seeing the monks and nuns and feeling the, the invisible to the senses but genuine spiritual vibe of Gold Mountain Monastery. And I said, I've been here before, I'm back. A little voice inside my mind said, you're back, you're safe, go to work. And I felt like a knot in my heart that I didn't even know was tied up, just untied. And I felt at home. So people have experiences like that we, we meet it for the first time in our lives and we're pulled into this uh, search for wisdom and compassion. And it's a journey, it's definitely travel. You, you travel along and you move and you step and you step and you go and you go. And it's not always uh, 
linear. Sometimes we meet obstacles and it takes, for example, one of the, the measurements of growing in our tradition is learning mantras. And anybody who wants to um, become a regular practitioner meets pretty quickly the great compassion mantra, the Dabe Jo, Namo Hulladano Dolaye. Then we meet the Sharangama mantra, the, the, this long, uh, grand, noble, five-part mantra that takes about 15 minutes to recite if you go at a steady pace. And learning the Sharangama mantra by, by memor to memory, memorizing it, is, uh, is a milestone, right? It's recommended to memorize it. And uh, you spend days and days with the book in your hand, learning the mantra. And of course, we talk about that among ourselves in the Sangha. And many people have the experience of getting a bit of the mantra, and then for some reason you can't memorize it. You try and just bounce off because it's sinicized Sanskrit. It's Sanskrit words with Chinese pronunciation. Namo sadanto su che do ye ula hu di sam miao sam pu to xie namo sadanto fo to ju ju shiny shan. That's Sanskrit with Chinese syllables. Okay. It's hard to memorize. It's because there's no referent, there's no image for it. It's just brute memorization. Many people report that as you try to memorize it, you get to a point and you s stop. You just, it won't go in, won't go in. And you try and you try and a week later, two weeks later, you're still on that same, you memorize it and you don't, it's gone. It's just, it leaks out like a hole in the cup, like water dripping out of a cup with a hole in it. And then somehow you got it. And then like you get a big chunk, like, oh, 12 lines, 20 lines. And then up, boom, obstacle. Can't memorize it. Can't memorize. So it takes a while, right? And everybody reports the same phenomenon, that it's hard to memorize the Shurangama Mantra. Master Shuenhua <laughs> memorized it in, I don't want to say it wrong. He would scold me if I said it wrong. Was it a day, 24 hours did it take? He memorized the Great Compassion Mantra on a train ride, half an hour to memorize 90, the 90, 86 lines of the, of the Great Compassion Mantra. But the Sharangama took him, how long was it? Somebody will, Chin Chuan, anybody know, remember the actual story? How many hours did it take Shurfu to memorize the entire Sharangama Mantra? Somebody, somebody will know that answer, okay. Um, anyway, that's, how do we do that? How does that happen? the ease of memorization or, or troubles memorizing, clearly it has to do with having the, these kind of archetypal paradigms. These patterns are there in the mind. Okay, and when we meet it again, it's activated and it's from the past. So the Buddha Dharma talks about past lives, it's reincarnation, this is uh, the idea of continuity, right? That this life in this body, the body is very much a vessel for the continuation of something invisible but real. And you could say it's the, the seeds of karma, of action in past, both good, meaning things coming to us in this life, that we are owed from the past, and negative, things that we have to undergo, the retribution of negative deeds. So those are the real things, and they travel, according to this theory, in what's called the eighth consciousness, to the next body. And so the, um, let's say the uh, connections that we make with wisdom and the Buddha Dharma, these deep teachings done in lives past, manifest in our next life. And of course, as we leave our last body and travel to the next one, those physical memories of, oh, I remember I lived in this body, in this country, ate this for breakfast, 
uh, met Buddhism when I was 24 years old and memorized the Sharangma Mantra. We don't remember those details unless we have the Buddha's insight and wisdom. But in any case, in this life, when we meet it again, if it's been there before, pop, it's easy. Uh, it took me months to get the Sharangama Mantra. It was not easy and there were these obstacles. Okay, so this is a long digression talking about our Bodhisattva who is now um, at the end of his journey to Buddhahood um, because of the work that has gone on from, they say, Chu Fashin, first making that Bodhi resolve, going to the first stage, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, now to the tenth stage, and all the incredible learning that, is, that has been required, right? It takes a long time to accumulate all that knowledge. And one thing we might consider, what was the fuel that powered this bodhisattva search to where he is now on the tenth stage? And the sutra reminds us over and over again that the power that motivates the bodhisattva to get up and put on his or her running shoes again the next day is compassion. And compassion, the way the Buddha describes it, the way our sutra describes it here, is called tongti, same body, identity, that this cultivator from that earliest stepping into a place where this awakening begins to unfold like a flower opening its petals. From that earliest encounter in this life with, with the seeds of the Dharma, what happens is the barriers get reduced between us and everyone else. So tong ti, same body, Dabe, great compassion, must mean that at this point, this bodhisattva is living in a different body than they were when they first joined that first mindfulness course, right? That first class of Buddhist philosophy, that first step into a monastery, that first bite of vegetarian food, right? Bit by bit, the, the barriers between me and everyone else are reduced. So things that other beings feel, the bodhisattva feels, things that other beings think, the bodhisattva thinks, the only difference is, for him now, it's conscious, conscious. It's not out of control, it's very much in a dharma form. Um, in Chinese, fa, that word that, is trans that, dharma, that translates dharma, it can also be a verb meaning to imitate, to mold, to hold that shape, right? Fa ta, you, you mold him, M-O-U-L-D, like uh, a candle mold or an, uh, a lead mold. It used to make, we used to pour lead and make soldiers, remember? Then we discovered that lead was poison. Mm. So that mold that happens, the molding that goes on, um, is how the Bodhisattva is able to let down his or her own identities and tongti be the same, feel the same as everyone else without losing his or her form and vows and practices. If you really let go of everything that you know is you and identify with everything going on around you, what if the things going on around you are negative? Or what if you're heading off on a 
Saturday afternoon breaking social distancing and going to a bar to drink off social distancing, to drink off, you know, to, to lose your fear in alcohol, lose your grief. Do you want to be tong ti with that person? No, of course. The bodhisattva now, because of the molding of the Dharma, because of the practices and the vows, particularly the precepts of the bodhisattva, he or she is able to identify, be the same with every living being around them, especially the ones who are going wrong, and not lose his or her form and vows, but at the same time totally identify, totally understand their pain. I feel your pain, right, said our former president. And how nice, but if you feel my pain and then you go off and do stupid stuff, then it hurts more, right? Well, this bodhisattva doesn't go off and do stupid stuff, but totally identifies with every living being around. And uh, so you're looking at, at my screen. I've got a rainbow lorikeet here, the very handsome looking bird. Um, I have a couple of rainbow lorikeets, a male and a female, who live uh, in, in, my, in the trees in front of my balcony. And uh, they are the first ones there every morning and the last ones to leave. Then there's a flock of other local lorikeets who, who show up for the food every morning and every afternoon, twice a day. And today, as I was preparing for the lecture today, my goodness, uh, somebody showed up who was suddenly not welcome. And there was a gang fight. There was a rumble that went on for minutes in front of my balcony between the lorikeets. And I could feel it in my bones that somebody was being chased away. And ordinarily, it's kind of a hit, or run, hit and run. They just, and they go away. But this went on and on and on. And everybody was all bunched up and, and attacking and dive bombing. And while these birds tend to be kind of thuggish, they, they're quick to, to chase others away. But it was like no other fight uh, that, I, that I have experienced. And when it was over, I had to actually... Uh, calm myself down because the, uh, the, the fighting was so intense going on. Somebody was being excluded from there. And uh, finally, our, I think our couple may have been prote protecting their turf from an ill-tempered lorikeet who came in, but usually they welcome the newcomers. It was not today. And uh, because I'm quarantining, you know, out with uh, Alex is in the back and, and uh, the nuns are, are a quarter of a mile away, um, we don't see people in, during the day. I may speak half a dozen words in any given day. Um, and so anything that happens with the intensity of the lorikeet gang war, turf war, rumble, uh, I feel it intensely. And I'm wondering, how does a bodhisattva be able to um, truly feel great compassion without being washed away by the intensity of feeling of living beings who are what in bound to do wrong going off to create living beings karma right and uh, how about the grief of a family I shared a, a chat on the internet today with somebody who has three members of their four members of their family all with infected by COVID-19, coronavirus. And this person is just trying to keep going, knowing that uh, it, it's touch and go, whether those four members of the family will still be alive in two weeks, right? And uh, this story is being told around the globe today. So my goodness, uh, how, do you, how does the Bodhisattva survive? Right? In this, and, and it has to do with the power of practices and vows. But let's take a look right here. Here is how I think. I want to bring this up. Uh, Sam, I'm going to click on the, uh, the document called The Ten Goods and Ten Evils. I think it's right here under my. There we are. And this is, the sutra mentions this 
as uh, what the Bodhisattva is now able to do because he is a Chakravartin. Look at this. This is from the uh, second ground. This is not the tenth ground. We're not the tenth ground. This is the second stage. This is the, the, we're on the tenth stage. This is the second stage. And this comes right out of the sutra. And look what it says. It says, disciples of the Buddha, our bodhisattva on the second stage makes this resolve. He says, the offense of killing can lead living beings to fall among the hells, hungry ghosts, and animals. Now, if you do that a lot, and you're still reborn as a human, you didn't lose your human body because of your killing that you did. You come back as a human, there is still repercussions. You're, if you're reborn among people, you'll have two kinds of retribution. One, a short lifespan. And two, many illnesses. So here's the sutra talking about what? Cause and effect. Look at this. This is the Buddha's description in the Avatamsaka Sutra of the details of what happens when we do not uphold the 10 good deeds, but instead do the 10 evil deeds. And the 10 good deeds come from the absence of the 10 evil deeds. Look at this. So when I read this the first time, it was like, ah, my jaw dropped because it was clear. So, what happens when somebody comes into the world and passes away quickly, a short lifespan? It, according to the Sutra, may be, now this is not absolutely the case, but in a classic situation, it's because that person in a past life, before they came to this world, in this body, killed a lot, took the life of others, and as a result, they came back as a human, but they, their lifespan was short and they had a lot of illness. Now, we're in a situation of global pandemic, right? And bodies are piling up beyond anything we've experienced ever in the US, right, and around the world. And it is tragic, and it is heartbreaking, and it is, you know, grief-filled, this experience we're going through. It's horrific. And yet, you say, why? Why is that? Now, I'm not saying I know. I don't know the answer. But it has something to do with killing when so many people lose their lives. And some of the anecdotes that we know say that there is this wet market in Wuhan, right, Hubei. And what is a wet market? It's where exotic animals come to die because people kill them to eat them. Even the strangest of animals from Africa Pangolins. Pangolins are not native to China. They come from Southeast Asia, right? And yet they think that it was pangolins killing and eating or killing for their scales that may have allowed this coronavirus, which we had no protection against, to jump the species. Maybe that's one thing they think. Their bats have been talked about. Uh, not necessarily that people ate the bats, but maybe bat blood or uh, bats were made in, into soup or something that then, you know, uh, people got sick from. We don't know. But the, the thing that is overlooked is the action of human beings killing other species. Says the sutra, short lifespan, much illness, results from lots of killing. We're in a human body, but that has happened. Okay, so I'm just saying here is a what? This is a classic model for situations where people die young or are sick a lot. Okay, the classic model for reference, right? Look at that as a model. The Buddha says, yeah, 
If we want to reverse it, what then? The sutra doesn't say this, but I'm following Master Shrenhua's exhortation for us to take the sutra as, this sounds disrespectful, take it as shoes and walk in it. Take the sutra as a mirror and look at our reflection. Take the sutra as a map and chart our course with it. Take the sutra as your best friend, someone you can't do without speaking to every single day. He said, be creative, illustrate it, talk about it, sing it, right? But get involved in the wisdom of the sutra because that's what the Buddha had in mind. It's for use. Sutras are for use, not for worshiping exclusively. Okay, so with that injunction in mind, what I did was flip the Avatamsaka's description of the 10 goods and 10 evils around and say, the, bodhis the Chakravartin, wheel-turning king, and our Bodhisattva on the 10th stage is now able to practice the 10 good deeds. So what is a good deed cueing off the negative deed? The negative deed is the offense of killing. So what about the virtue of cherishing life? That is to say, not only not killing, but extending the life of beings already alive. What would that be like? So I thought about that. I said, if the offense of killing creates the retribution as a human of short lifespan, many illnesses, the virtue of cherishing life should theoretically create the reward of longevity and good health. Right? That would make sense, right? Sutra doesn't say that. I said that. I flipped it over and said, okay, killing, short life, illness, cherishing life, fostering life, giving life, feeding, not killing, not stepping on spiders, right? And pulling, pulling animals that you see in the road uh, when they're, you know, if they're still alive, stopping your car and rescuing them results in what? Good life, long life, and good health. Okay, hmm. makes sense, maybe, right? Food for thought. What about that? What about that? Okay, number two, look at this one. The offense of stealing. What? You can become a hell dweller, a ghost, an animal, because it's an evil deed. But suppose you have good karma as well, and that mixture brings you back as a person, you have two kinds of retribution. One, even though you have a human body, you're poor. Or two, your wealth that should come to you is held in common and you don't have free use of it. What does that mean? Think of checks, your st stimulus check, right? Think of your tax return. Should come to you, doesn't, right? Think of social benefits, social service. Should, should come to you right? Doesn't. It doesn't. It gets held up somehow. Your pension check, right? Why? Because, says the sutra, you, with your hands, deprive someone else of something they should have. The result is, you don't get something that you should have, says the sutra. So, cause and effect. When I read this the first time, I was like, wow, that is so clear. That is not Buddhist philosophy, with people accuse the Avatamsaka Sutra of being philosophy. Well, it has philosophical elements. It is for use. It is a path to walk on, the road under your feet to wisdom, right? So, okay, flip it over. The Sutra didn't say this, I said this. Okay, the offense of stealing, retribution. One, you're poor. Two, your wealth is, not held, is held in common. You don't have free use of it. Social security, tax returns, scholarship, pension. What would be if you gave, not only did you not steal, but you were generous? One, you have personal wealth. Two, benefits come to you from the commonwealth. You get the fellowship, right, when you apply. Your social security check is never late. It's always there safely in the mailbox. It's not stolen. Mail thief doesn't steal it. It comes to your hands you get it, right? Plus, you're wealthy. Because why? 
you benefited others with your wealth. As a result, in the next life, that wealth is there for you, right? It's exactly the opposite of what stingy people assume. This is so interesting. If money is the only thing we think about day in, day out, oh, money, how do I get money? I need money. Rich people are the best people, right? How do you know somebody's good? They have a lot of money, right? If that's the way we interpret the world, if we look through that, that lens, and because of that view, we pinch pennies, we feel like we never should give money, we shouldn't be generous to people, the opposite of what we assume happens, which is what? We don't get wealthy. Wealth doesn't stay with us. We feel poor, even if we might have enough wealth. We always feel in need of more money. Whereas, using wisdom, you flip it around. If we give, if we are always the first one to share what we have with others, if when we get some, we share it immediately with others so that more people are happy, right? The result is we always feel sufficient, contented. We have plenty. I don't need more. I have all that I need, right? How interesting the way this, this wisdom works. Okay, let's look at one more. Uh, we have enough time to look at one more here. This is uh, a third. What are we looking at? I'll re repeat. What we're talking about is the 10 goods and the 10 evils. Our bodhisattva on the 10th stage here is a, uh, as a Chakravartin, as, a, as a, the analogy was a Chakravartin, the Buddhist side was the bodhisattva. Uh, as uh, in this new position, he is fully able to practice the 10 good deeds. So what are they? Okay, 10 good deeds. Where do we go? Oh, Flower Garland Sutra, second stage, DRD, right? There it is. What does it say? It says, suppose you do the evil, the offense of sexual misconduct can lead you to fall among the hells, ghosts, and animals. This is called an evil deed of the body, lust, essentially. You are either a adulterer, you broke your vows, or two, you are promiscuous and you hurt people with your own se selfish sexual desire. If you do that a lot, you can lose your human body, says the Buddha. What else? Suppose you also have good karma, so you come back as a human, but the retribution is still with you. What is it? One, your spouse will cheat on you. And two, the relationships you have will not make you happy. The people you meet will not suit you, not in accord with your intent. You're gonna meet someone that's just like, not quite right. And, oh, you know? And the people you do get close to, intimately, your partners, will cheat, right? Why? Because you created the energy of sexual misconduct, but you're still back as a human. So how many heartbreak stories are contained in this principle? How many sad, sad songs, you know, how many country songs <laughs> were launched because of this particular principle? Okay, so if we say that's the case, then flip it around and I didn't, the Buddha didn't say this, I said this. The offense of sexual misconduct, retribution is your spouse won't be good or faithful, or your friends and your group will not suit you. Your family won't, you won't be people you like to live with. What happens if you are true? You will have a faithful spouse and a supportive community. Everybody you hang with will support you. And the person that you are particularly paired with will be true and honest, right? No doubt. So, by looking at it this way, by doing the reversing the 10 evil deeds and their retributions into the 10 wholesome deeds with their rewards, what have we got here? What does it mean to fully practice? It means choose your future. Empower yourself to create your future. Become the architect of your future by doing the 10 good deeds, which Master Hua would often say, just avoid 
the ten evil deeds and you step into the ten good deeds. So, how about that? We heard about Chakravartins. Uh, how do you become a Chakravartin? Master Hua would say, Qin shi wu jie, feng xing shi shan. Shou chi wu jie, feng xing shi shan. He would say, hold the five precepts and practice the ten good deeds. And the blessings that result from that takes us to the heavens, beyond humanity, he would say. And then he would follow up by saying, not recommend it. <laughs> don't do that. I don't recommend it. Uh, you probably don't want to be a god. God's, it's pleasant. Sure, it's pleasant. But uh, heavenly, divine, yeah, blissful, yeah. But you have to come back to cultivate in the end if you really want to get wise and compassionate. So, how interesting, right? Okay, uh, let's review. Take a look again at uh, how that fits into our sacred story today. What did it say? It said, our Tathagata, our, our Bodhisattva, uh, sorry, our Chakravartin is immediately able to practice the 10 wholesome paths and he is called a wheel-turning monarch. The bodhisattva, in the same way, appointed to the rank, gets anointment on the crown of his head with the water of wisdom. It's called being appointed to the rank. He can make perfect the ten powers of the Tathagata. He is counted among the Buddhas. This is known as the bodhisattva's appointment to the ranks of great wisdom. Okay, now, people are saying, we heard about the ten good deeds. What about the ten powers? Ten powers, ten wisdom powers, we talked about those two weeks ago in detail when they first came up. Uh, we will refer to them once again next week, but today was the day for the 10 good deeds and the 10 wholesome, the 10 evil deeds, and they're, they're flip side, they're, they're reverse. Okay, uh, hey, hey, how about that? Having uh, brought those out, I'd like to invite anybody from the Sangha who is listening there at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Anybody has a comment? Anything you'd like to say about, uh, about these, any of the topics today? Not that you have to. Um, if you'd care to, I'd like to invite you to, to, to contribute. Hi, Dora Master, this is Jin He. If Hello? not, I'm going to introduce you to the king of the bush. Look at the king of the bush. Kookaburra up in the old gum tree. Here's an old gum tree. Merry, merry king of the bushes. He, he is not a wheel-turning king. He's a uh, veggie ham-eating king, right? Laugh, kookaburra, laugh, kookaburra. Gay your life must be. Oh, Chin Husher was speaking. Oh, sorry. I didn't hear him. I can't hear. Uh, can oh. you hear me now? Okay, Chin Husher, uh, you please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, Let me know when you're done because I can't hear you. Oh, okay. It's nothing important. It's just uh, the opening of the sutra. It just kept on playing in my head throughout the, the lecture as like a Hollywood here. movie. Maybe I'll type it out. I'll, I'll type it in the chat. Yeah. The opening of today's sutra kept playing in my head like a Hollywood movie. Oh. Um, what in particular? What what part of the opening? The uh, the the ceremony part. The whole image of being anointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's um, our. Can I, is it my turn? Let me know when Jin Husher's done. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, me too. Um, these, you know, the sutra is so varied. This is the Flower Garland Sutra, and they describe it as a, a like a, a, a Hawaiian lei, flower lei, blossom, blossom, strung together on a, on a cord. Um, so much variety in the sutra. Um, there are always lists of ten things, ten samadhis, right? And then ten dharanis, and then uh, a dialogue between the, the, the Buddha and Subhuti, or the Buddha and the Shariputra. Um, and then there will be uh, descriptions like we just saw, cause and effect. But this part of the tenth stage is really cinematic. It's really like a movie, you know, there's, there's drama. There are things happen. People are doing amazing things. And then when we find Catholic bishops also getting anointed on the crown, when we find Russian czars getting anointed on the crown, it's like, why is this ceremony so, so uh, significant when someone is being confirmed to a new position? It's really fascinating. Yeah. And because it's the sutra, these images go deep. I'm, you know, I, I kind of go lighthearted in a sense of uh, sacred storytelling, you know. But to be able to hear a scene out of the Avatamsaka Sutra, um, it goes so deep in our conscious mind, our subconscious mind. In our, uh, these are powerful images from the Buddha's enlightened nature. So it's not so simple, but it is wonderful indeed. So thanks for sharing that. We'll have to uh, figure out how I, uh, why I'm not hearing everybody next time. Okay, um, in accord, uh, Professor Verhoeven has been, uh, in his lectures, has been giving reflections on the coronavirus situation and um, we, have a lot of spiritual medicine available to us in the Mahayana tradition. And our Buddha known as Medicine Buddha, and Jin Hosher, who just spoke, is explaining the Medicine Buddha Sutra on Dharma Realm Live, our YouTube channel. So if you go to Dharma Realm Live, you can see when he, when he gives his lecture. Um, Medicine Buddha has a mantra um, called the Medicine Buddha mantra for Guan Ding, Guan Ding, for anointing the crown, anointing the crown of the head. How about that? So here is, this is uh, It may be, this is a thought that I had about this, and asking why... Um, why is this ceremony the thing? Why do they do this? It may be, it may have something to do with the inner experience of what people call in kundalini uh, yoga, that there is a physical f uh, phenomenon that some people report where they say the meridian from the back, the du mai, and the meridian, meridian in the front, the ren mai, connect and people talk about uh, having an experience like water on the crown of the head, um, cooling. And maybe there's an actual physical referent for what we then enact as an external ceremony, a ritual. Who knows? Maybe it's something like that. Uh, certainly, Guanyin Bodhisattva with her sweet dew, Dan Lu Shui, right? With her willow branch, she gives people this experience of feeling cool water uh, down, go down the head. And I actually, I'll tell a story about that in just a minute. So here is, uh, before we finish, here is Medicine Buddha's mantra for anointing the crown. We've done it for a couple weeks now, so you all should sing along.
That's it. Om Namo Bhagavate Vaisajya Guru Vaidurya Prabharajaya Arahate samyak samgudaya padyata Bhai saje, bhai saje, namo bhai sajya Ahandate swaha om namo bhagavate Saja Guru Bhai Durya Prabharajaya Tathagataya Arahate Samyak Sambudaya Adhyata Bhai Saja Bhai Saja Samudate Swaha Om Namo Bhagavate Bhai Saja Guru Bhai Durya Prabharajaya Patagataya Arahate Samyak Sambudaya I saw I saw Send out that mantra to dispel the negativity, maybe of too much killing. Possibly that's it. Um, I think it's, certainly it's a good place to start if we want to change the, the environment that, that created so much death among humans this time. Uh, story, quick story, and then we'll transfer merit and we're done. This story um, comes from a Dharma friend of ours, um, I won't give her name because that's not fair, but her Dharma name is Gautong and her husband's name is Gautong, um, two Dharma friends. Early uh, disciples of Master Srinhua when he was teaching in Buddhist lecture hall and then at Gold Mountain in San Francisco, um, fell in love and were married at Gold Mountain Monastery. Um, married uh, in a Buddhist ceremony, one of the very first to be married. And uh, Guotong, the wife, was a, a nurse, uh, RN, in a local hospital. And she and her husband wanted to start a family. And she couldn't. She couldn't. She, no matter what, they were somehow frustrated. They weren't able to conceive. And so they came uh, to Master Hua, came to their Shurfu, and said, Shurfu, we want to have a baby, but we can't. And uh, he says, hmm, he said, you really don't believe. If you really believed, you'd know that Guanyin Bodhisattva grants sons and daughters to those who request for them and then cultivate her dharmas faithfully. And she said, yes, yeah, sure, for we believe, but I, I checked with the doctor in my hospital and he said, I am never going to have children. I'm not physically capable of it. He said, my plumbing is wrong. He said, Master Hua said, hmm, you simply don't have enough faith in Guanyin Bodhisattva. Oh, she said, oh, okay. So they started reciting the Great Compassion Mantra. They memorized it. They recited it and they got their friends to recite it. And uh, then uh, came in and one day I was there in the temple. They came in, Shurpa, 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 guess what? I'm pregnant, I can have a baby. Oh, that's good. And uh, he said, see, you just, you need more faith. You should be even more faithful. And so uh, 
they went on and then like six months later uh, now Fran uh, Gotong came in and uh, uh, said Shervo Shervo the, the doctor says my baby is a breech birth I'm going to have trouble giving birth maybe we should think about some alternative Shervo said hmm, you just don't have enough faith what's right you really need to be more faithful Guan Yin Bodhisattva will deliver you from your fears and worries you need to cultivate harder so she Guan Yin Bodhisattva got her friends to make images they all had a Guan Yin Bodhisattva image party and painted images of Guan Yin and, and learned the mantra and just recited started reciting the universal door chapter from the Lotus Sutra of Puman Pin and uh, so uh, came the day and Guotong went into the hospital to deliver her baby and all the friends were gathered around the uh, outside the, the room uh, in the hospital in the hallway and uh, they were like reciting like mad reciting Guan Yin Bodhisattva's mantra great compassion mantra and uh, uh, the doors opened up and out came the gurney and here was Guotong and her eyes were just like this and she had this beatific smile on her face and all the friends gathered around and they went <gasps> what happened and she could speak and she said she said I was I was feeling pain and I remembered to recite Guan Yin's name and I looked down at the foot of the bed and there was this woman wearing a white robe she was so kind and I felt this coolness like water on the crown of my head and it just went down my face like and all the pain went away and it was just transcendent she said and everybody in the hallway was just getting goosebumps and chills and they said and the baby and she said eight pounds red hair <laughs> she said so it's like oh you know so all that group of friends just rededicated themselves to cultivating Guan Yin Bodhisattva's dharmas because their faith got a huge boost that day and then Gotong and Gotong went on to have a second son, both of them over six feet tall with red hair. So, how about that? Medical science was amazed, right? So Master Hua just went, hmm, you all don't believe in Guan Yin Bodhisattva very strongly or you wouldn't have those doubts. Of course she grants your wishes. You just have to cultivate according to her wishes. So, that's a story from the front lines about Guan Ding what it's like when you really cultivate these practices, Medicine Buddha's mantra with true faith. All right, uh, let me remind everybody that, let's see, I'm going to bring up another document here. Um, if you would like to cultivate, um, let's see here, I'm going to remove this. If you would like to practice along with the monks at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, let me direct you to a website, that's all Chakrabarton, where you can join in, www.berkeleymonastery.org. That's a place where if you go join, you will find the monks, uh, pretty much all day, doing a variety of Dharma practices, morning chanting, evening chanting. Um, there, that Berkeley Monastery will show you, it's called BBM Online. BBM Online. And online, there we go. And it will take you to Zoom, where you have to sign up and it will take you to YouTube where you don't have to sign up. Two different sites, places where those practices are going on. Morning and evening chanting, sutra lectures, uh, Chan meditation plus reflections, and the name of Guan Yin Bodhisattva, and playing of what's called the ground bell, reciting the Buddha's name, uh, Medicine Buddha Sutra. All these different activities are available for you now, uh, by and large, uh, not 24 seven, but you know, pretty close. Uh, okay, it's 
forward slash HTML. Here we go. Forward slash BBM online with a hyphen dot HTML. There it is. That's the full check. Is that right? Everybody who knows BBM online. Okay, it looks like it. So try that. Um, see what you think. It's a chance for people to get involved uh, during the day while we're quarantining ourselves, we're socially distancing, uh, where you can actually experience uh, how the monks are practicing. And it's pretty neat. I mean, to be able, we're for morning chant, we have more people joining morning chanting than ever before, right? So the, you'll have to accord with the times there, um, find out when they're doing those events. Okay, so that's for everybody. Please do check it out. And I want to extend my appreciation to uh, the staff of DRBA Tech, uh, both in California and here in the Gold Coast for making this all possible, for getting us online. A lot of, a lot of work goes into these, uh, these lectures and many, many conditions and I just get to sit here and, and tell stories, so uh, I'm very grateful. And would like to invite all of you now to make a wish. How would you like your merit from listening to this lecture taking part? How would you like your merit to go out into the world? Uh, so I'm told that on YouTube we have uh, 160 today on YouTube. 58 from China. Once again, 58, yeah, lovely, okay. The word is going out. So that creates some opportunity for dedication, right? We can dedicate the merit. So make a wish however you would like your merit to go out. Tikkun olam, repair the world. as one and radiant with life. Share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Thank you all for joining everyone. See you next week. Omitofu.